Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to see you again. <coughs> As you know, I have been traveling for much of the past month. I have been to Gaza and seen with my own eyes the human suffering there. <clears throat> I have been to Kabul, Islamabad, and Baghdad, Davos, and New Delhi, and some other place. Wherever I went, I spoke for ordinary people, <clears throat> people at risk from climate change, people living in fear or war, uh, people who have lost their homes, their livelihoods, and their children and families. Uh, let me begin with a brief overview of my most recent trip. It began two weeks ago with a high-level meeting on food security for all in Madrid, Spain. We do not see many references these days to the food crisis in the news. <clears throat> it has been eclipsed by economic fears, but we are not still out of food. I call it our forgotten crisis, because it has not gone away. Kenya recently warned of a state of food emergency affecting one quarter of its population, some 25 million people. Kenya is not alone, and that is why with the Spanish Prime Minister uh, Zapatero, I called on the international community to keep its priority uh, straight. <clears throat> we called loudly for a sharp increase in agricultural assistance uh, to the most vulnerable nations. Spain led by example uh, with 1 billion euros over five years. A time of economic hardship, I told the delegates in Madrid, it's a time to get back to basics. No human rights is more basic than the right to eat. At the World Economic Forum in Davos, I spoke again for ordinary people people too easily forgotten amid the strumont drang of economic troubles. Despite the hard times, we must not waver in our commitment to the world's poor. We reminded wealthy nations of their pledges under the Millennium Development Goals. In Davos, I urged the donors to be more forthcoming. I sought new partnerships and allies, uh, political leaders, uh, business executives, and philanthropist. Now, more than ever, it is time to deliver. During periods of crisis, it is essential to keep our eye on the big picture. That, too, is why I went to Davos Forum, to speak out on climate change. <clears throat> the negotiations to be completed in Copenhagen by the end of this year require global leadership of the highest order. We have no time to lose. The United States, China, India, and the European Union, and many other countries all must show the way. We must provide for those least able to adapt. I repeated this call at the African Union Summit meeting in Addis Ababa, even as discussions turned to issues of peace and security. I'm encouraged by developments in Somalia and was pleased to learn that additional African contingents are ready to reinforce the African Union mission in Somalia, Amisom. The election of a new president is a direct result of my representative's efforts. <clears throat> we will do everything we can to assure that the African force has what it needs to act. <clears throat> Darfur was a topic of intense discussion. I urged President Bashir of Sudan to cooperate fully with the UN missions and ensured the safety and security of our staff and premises. He agreed to do so. Publicly and privately, I pressed both the government and rebel forces around the city of Buhajeria to withdraw and to safeguard the civilians. Both sides have largely complied. I told everyone I spoke to, bluntly and categorically, 
that the UN would stand its ground. The situation in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo has improved dramatically. We agreed, however, that the ceasefire is fragile and that the UN peacekeeping forces must be reinforced in order to consolidate this progress. I welcome the Zimbabwe's progress in forming a unity government. But I told President Mugabe very frankly that they still have far to go. I emphasize to the President that the government must protect the human rights and democratic freedoms of all Zimbabweans. I urged him to release all those arrested or secretly detained in recent months. I remain especially concerned about the humanitarian situation. According to the latest figures from WHO, an estimated 3,400 people have died of cholera. More than 69,000 have been infected. On Friday next week, I will send the high-level UN humanitarian assessment mission to Zimbabwe, led by Assistant Secretary General of OCHA, Catherine Bragg. From Addis, I went to Afghanistan to meet with President Karzai. This is the critical year for addressing that country's security challenges and strengthening its democratic institutions. That presupposes a better coordinated and better financed humanitarian and development effort. It requires good governance, free of corruption. It is impossible to come away from Kabul without a strong feeling that we need a stronger, more concerted, a more strategic approach in Afghanistan if our work over the past seven years is to succeed. Regional cooperation is essential. I have discussed with this with many international leaders in recent months, including U.S. Special Envoy Richard <coughs> Holbrook. I raised all these issues as well in Islamabad with President Zaldari, Prime Minister Jilani, and others. I emphasized the importance of good relations with India and stressed the need for a full investigation into the Mumbai attacks. I also announced the creation of an independent UN commission to investigate the assassination of former Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto to be headed by Ambassador Geraldo Munoz of Chile. In India, I addressed the Delhi Sustainable Development Summit. I argued forcefully for green growth, a Green New Deal that stimulates economic growth and fights climate change by investing in renewable energy. This is a theme I will carry <coughs> forward at the upcoming G20 summit meeting in London on April 2nd. We face a global financial crisis. We therefore need a well-coordinated, synchronized global stimulus package that protects the world's poor as well as the rich. <coughs> Peacemill nationalist protectionist policies will only hurt us all. I concluded my trip with a stop in Baghdad where I met President Jalal Talabani and Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki and other parliamentary leaders. <clears throat> I wanted to show solidarity with Iraq's people. I wanted to congratulate them on such a resoundingly successful election conducted democratically and without violence. <clears throat> I'm very proud of the UN's role. For the people of Iraq, it is an immense step forward toward a participatory, participatory democracy. Visiting Baghdad, I found a new sense of confidence and optimism. If current trends continue, I can foresee a much greater role for United Nations agencies throughout Iraq during the coming month. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, let me close with a few remarks on two other crises. I am gravely concerned at the plight of the tens of thousands of people caught by fighting in Sri Lanka. I telephoned President Mahinda Rajapaksa from India and expressed my deep concern of the high number of civilian casualties. 
<coughs> he assured me that he would take all measures to safeguard the civilian population. I stressed that all actions must be consistent with the principles of international humanitarian law. I remain no less concerned about the situation in Gaza. I saw with my own eyes how difficult life has become for ordinary people. These difficulties have not diminished since my visit. All but one border crossing remains closed. Nearly one million refugees depend on daily UN aid. Yet we are getting in surprise for only 30,000. <coughs> Meanwhile, Hamas militants on two occasions seized UN aid. The material has since been returned, but I have demanded that it not happen again. <coughs> Who pays the price? It is ordinary people, people without homes, without food or medicine. That is why in Davos, I launched a flash appeal worth $613 million to respond to emergency humanitarian needs in Gaza. That is why I'm going to take part in the Cairo conference on March 2nd, co-sponsored by the governments of Egypt and Norway with the United Nations and European Union. And that is why I returned to New York, determined to work harder than ever for peace in the Middle East. It is critical that we consolidate the ceasefire, promote Palestinian unity, and revive the peace process. I welcome the speed with which the U.S. President has engaged on this issue, particularly with the appointment of George Mitchell as Special Envoy to the Middle East. As Secretary General of the United Nations, I will devote every effort to helping push the peace process forward. Lastly, I should say that I have initiated steps to establish a UN Board of Inquiry into incidents involving death and damage at UN premises in Gaza. The board will be headed by Ian Martin of the United Kingdom and will include legal advisors and uh, military experts. It should start work immediately and report to me within a month. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, the first question goes uh, to the President of Ankara. Barack Obama yesterday and <coughs> Ahmadinejad today, they talk about uh, dialogue. If you speak with the President of the United States, you want to encourage him to do it sooner rather than later? Basic uh, policy and principle of me as Secretary General of the United Nations <coughs> is that all the pending issues difference of opinions or policies uh, should be resolved peacefully through dialogue. In that regard, I would encourage the older parties concerned to Iranian issues, including the United States, to engage in dialogue uh, to resolve this issue as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, the second question is uh, trying to accommodate those who didn't get a chance last time. So I, I'll go first to uh, Christine Salome, Al Jazeera. Today in Israel, the government there is expected to move uh, to the right. And I'm wondering how you think that might impact UN efforts in Gaza. In particular, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, one of the leading candidates, doesn't support a two state solution. Uh, he wants further military action, or he suggested that he would support further military action against Hamas. How will you deal with this government? on the issue of Gaza, and also have you gotten any update on Israel's investigation into UN attacks? Uh, are you pleased with the progress on that front? I think it is a bit early uh, for me to make any comments on this ongoing, continuing election process. I understand uh, they are uh, still in the process of election. We'll have to see uh, what kind of, uh, who will be the winner of this uh, uh, election and what kind of government uh, they will establish, uh, then I think we will discuss on all the matters concerning this Middle East peace process. Whoever may be in power in Israel, it would be important and desirable that they engage in a peace process uh, as soon as possible. 
Uh, we have um, a very fragile uh, ceasefire in Gaza, uh, which needs to be translated into a durable and uh, sustainable one. Uh, this is all what the international community expects. And for the investigation, uh, as I have uh, s stated, the United Nations is going to engage in uh, its own independent investigation. When I met uh, Israeli leaders, uh, including Prime Minister Olmert, uh, uh, when I was in, in uh, Israel, uh, I urged strongly to investigate and look into it, this matter thoroughly. He promised me that uh, he would look into this issue and investigate and will come back to us. And I'm awaiting uh, that uh, report. We go to Press TV, Mike Mazurko. He didn't get a chance last time either. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Um, you've been calling now for several days. We're coming on peace. We're starting to open the talk and provide some different people in terms of the situation in the United States. So we have to do that. There has been none that anyone can see. Uh, we still have the same status today as we did uh, before the war and now after the war. Uh, what is your opinion of the Israeli government's actions in this case? Is this a, uh, would you de describe this as a crime to, to seal off so many people from humanitarian aid? We're not even talking about recovery uh, and rebuilding materials. We're talking about food and humanitarian aid. It's not even recently, you know, all the times I have been consistently and persistently <clears throat> demanding that the Israeli government should open all uh, crossings to allow humanitarian assistance uh, smoothly and also to allow easy movement uh, of um, uh, Palestinians in, in Gaza. That is one of the ways to make this uh, ceasefire a durable and sustainable way. one. Now, there is another way of for making this uh, ceasefire durable one, that there should be some measure uh, to prevent uh, illicit uh, import of uh, weapons and ammunition into Gaza. Therefore, I would urge you again that uh, there should be uh, all the crossings open. I understand that again uh, today because of uh, the election in Israel, the crossings all but one are uh, all uh, closed. Uh, we are having a serious uh, difficulty, particularly our office in UNRWA, uh, who has been taking care of all humanitarian assistance daily basis to uh, three quarter of uh, total population of uh, Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, we are experiencing serious uh, difficulty in uh, getting all the materials, humanitarian assistance. So it is absolutely necessary that uh, they open these crossings. I will continue to urge. Yeah. Uh, we go to Bill Warner, uh, Bloomberg News. Did get a chance last time either. Thank you, Michelle. On uh, Myanmar, uh, Mr. Secretary General, you met with Gum Mr. Gambari after his most recent visit. Uh, there was very little indication that that visit produced any results. There's a quote that AFP ran from uh, the spokesman for Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, National League for Democracy party saying, quote, I must say I did not see any development yet overall of the UN envoy visit, which did not include a, any kind of meeting with uh, uh, General Than Shui. Is it time to admit that th this track, this particular track, the gloves are really not uh, moving the government in a significant way and, and look elsewhere for help, perhaps to the Security Council for action under Chapter 7? Is it time to sort of uh, pursue a different strategy and admit that, that this just isn't <coughs> working? It's true that uh, Mr. Gambari was not able to meet uh, Senior General Tan Shen, <clears throat> but he was able to meet with um, uh, Prime Minister Tan Shen and uh, Do Aung San Suu Kyi and executive members of uh, the uh, NLD uh, parties. And he had uh, good discussions there, even though uh, one may not be uh, totally uh, satisfied. I look forward to building on this visit with a view to uh, further promoting national dialogue and rec reconciliation uh, through uh, his good offices and my good offices. And I would again uh, call on government and opposition to resume substantive uh, dialogue without uh, preconditions and without further uh, delay. 
And I'm also going to uh, discuss this matter with uh, friends of a group of friends on Myanmar uh, in a uh, in a short period of time, you know, in the near future. Yeah. We go to Joe Luria, Johannesburg uh, Star. Mr. John Zimbabwe, you didn't tell us what Mr. Mugabe's reaction was to you reading him the Riot Act. This is a man who scoffs at out outside. <laughs> Criticism. Could you describe a little better uh, how long this discussion took place and how did he react? Did, did he take you seriously? I'm not here to di disclose all the details which I had uh, <coughs> with the head of state of any government. Uh, but as I stated in my uh, opening remarks, uh, I told him that uh, even, th even though I welcome this unity a uh, government, uh, but I still, uh, I believe that still uh, it was not the perfect uh, unity. Uh, they should uh, build upon to make this unity uh, solid and substantively uh, adhering to the September 15 power sharing uh, agreement. He was open uh, to my call for international community support for inter uh, humanitarian assistance. And he agreed to my proposal to dispatch uh, high-level humanitarian uh, assessment teams. In fact, he appreciated the support uh, by many neighboring countries uh, for humanitarian assistance, particularly on uh, cholera epidemic, and particularly, again, the support from uh, WHO and UNICEF. Uh, see, he was quite open to that, but still, uh, we had not been able to narrow the gap on uh, political issues. Did you mention that now that South Africa is no longer on the council, that the council could move towards another attempt at putting sanctions on him? Did you mention this to him? I, I discussed with the president of South Africa on this issue uh, uh, most recently after uh, this uh, formation of a unity government announcement. And uh, we are working together closely with uh, South Africa and other members of uh, SADIC. Uh, yeah. Sylviane Zéhil, L'Orient Le Jour. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, uh, the 1st of March will uh, be the launching of the tribunal, uh, special tribunal for Lebanon. How much uh, are you um, confident that this uh, launching will not ignite a new crisis in Lebanon, and are you are you preparing a new uh, a new report for uh, the launching of this struggle? As I said many times, and this special tribunal for Africa to investigate into assassination of uh, former Prime Minister Haredi will officially be launched on March first uh, in in the Hague, Netherlands. And I'm going to uh, uh, dispatch uh, my uh, legal counsel, Assistant Secretary General Patricia O'Brien, to represent me in, a, in that uh, official uh, launching uh, ceremony. I'm confident that uh, this will uh, make a great a step forward in ensuring that there is no uh, impunity to any perpetrators of uh, uh, criminal acts. Uh, and at the same time, this launching of a special tribunal should give a very strong and important message to, uh, to the world as a whole for any such uh, potential uh, perpetrators uh, to prevent, to prevent uh, uh, such uh, potential uh, perpetrators. This is very important. And I'm not uh, concerned about all this, uh, uh, any uh, impact in uh, political stability. This will. On the contrary, will uh, solidify the political stability in Lebanon. Yes. <coughs> reports should come. Reports should come in due course when this uh, there is a progress. Yes. Okay, we go to Edi Ledwell, AP. Mr. Secretary General, um, I was wondering um, if you had um, had any discussions with. Uh, President Obama since he was elected, whether you've been listening to his speeches, whether you had any initial assessment of 
um, how he's engaging on a multinational track, and if you had any plans to see him. And just as a follow-up on what you <coughs> talked about on Afghanistan, um, since it's quite a big issue, I wonder if you s had any more specific ideas on um, how to uh, get some improvements in the consultations with the government other than promoting uh, regional ties. As you know, um, I had uh, two occasions of speaking over the phone with uh, President Obama during his uh, transition, right after his election, and right after right after his inauguration. I was very encouraged then when he called me uh, third day uh, after he was inaugurated. Uh, that I regarded as a strong commitment to his uh, uh, multilateralism. He told me clearly that he would find him as a strong partner of the United Nations and multilateralism. He supported all the major objectives and goals of the United Nations, uh, including uh, uh, climate change and Millennium Development Goals. Uh, you may remember that uh, he stated that Millennium Development Goal is an uh, American uh, goal, objective. And we also discussed on major regional issues like Afghanistan and Iraq and all uh, DLCs. And I'm quite confident that uh, we'll be able to work very closely. And I'm looking forward to an early opportunity of uh, meeting him uh, in Washington, D.C. to discuss all the matters, you know, uh, pertaining to uh, the global issues and other regional development issues, uh, which to which United Nations and United States uh, share a common, common goal. Uh, this, I'm very optimistic about uh, his engagement. And he's a very proactively engaging uh, policies on major, major issues. The very swift and decisive uh, uh, choice of uh, special envoys on Middle East and uh, uh, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan, uh, that was also a very good uh, and commendable uh, measures he has taken uh, at, at the very early stage of his administration. In that regard, uh, I'd like to uh, make some uh, clarification on the recent uh, uh, press report about uh, my intention of um, uh, convening <coughs> some high-level, summit-level meeting, inviting uh, President uh, Obama to discuss about uh, climate change. As you know, I have been pushing to involve world leaders in the pursuit of climate agreement for over two years. This has been my top priority issues. <clears throat> I have declared 2009 as the year of climate change, both because of the need to reach agreement by December in Copenhagen, as agreed by all UN <clears throat> member states, and because of the economic crisis uh, can only be truly solved if new approaches on climate and energy pave the way. Uh, reaching a new climate agreement this year will require direct involvement of world leaders. We need uh, direct involvement at the highest level of uh, government. I have been consulting actively about the best way uh, to engage them. One of the options I have discussed is a potential meeting of leaders in the next couple of months. Uh, on the question of the involvement of the United States, uh, we should all remind ourselves that President Obama has only been in office for three weeks. I have discussed the climate change with President Obama and Secretary Clinton in general terms and look forward to further discussions at the appropriate time. I understand they need to get uh, settled. I know that they are very busy with the uh, national stimulus package. I can confirm at this time that I am planning to organize a high-level event with the heads of state and government for all member states in the margins of the General Assembly in September. 
The report you have seen these days about the possible of convening uh, another high-level summit meeting is now in the process of uh, consulting with uh, countries concerned. Of course, uh, the participation of uh, <coughs> President Obama will be uh, crucially important. Uh, I'm going to continue uh, to discuss, uh, consult this matter with the U.S. administration. But at this time, I understand fully how uh, busily uh, President Obama is engaged in uh, uh, overcoming this national economic uh, crisis as well as uh, global uh, financial crisis. I hope uh, you'll understand this. Okay, I'll go first to BBC Afrique, uh, uh, Viku, then I'll come to you, Talal. <coughs> Did you meet the Libyan leader, Muhammad Gaddafi and Addis Ababa? I'm afraid the sound is inaudible to the interpreters. And what would you comment on the conflict resolution on the continent? Do you think that this would um, li be likely to facilitate things? And then secondly, with the economic crisis affecting all the major powers, how does this crisis have a direct impact on the, the UN regarding its funding? Um, will people lose their jobs in the UN uh, as well as elsewhere? Thank you. The question in France, yeah. Thank you very much for putting that question in French. Yes, I have uh, had a, a very good uh, interview with uh, President Gaddafi while I was in Addis Ababa. We were able to discuss the question of the crisis in the African continent and, in addition, how we could address the poverty program and how we could strengthen partnership between the United Nations and African nations. I was extremely satisfied with uh, my conversation with uh, President Gaddafi. We promised that we would work together very closely. I count on his leadership as the President of the African Union in the future, uh, over the course of the next year. I think that he too is very satisfied with my leadership as Secretary General of the United Nations. Thank you. He, he came, promised to come to New York in September, is that right? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, we can also <laughs> Good job, sir. Why don't you repeat your last question? Uh, <laughs> the financial crisis, which affects the major powers. We hear of uh, people actually losing their jobs in the United States and in Europe. Does this crisis have a direct impact on the workings of the United Nations and are people there in the UN losing their jobs because of this economic crisis? Uh, Japan. Doubtless, uh, I do think that the global financial crisis affects everybody, the United Nations included. This is why I myself was very committed, uh, am committed in my uh, talks with world leaders. I discussed uh, matters with Mr. Gaddafi as well to see how we could help the African countries during the financial crisis. It is the African countries which bear the brunt of this, and I'm very concerned at the challenges facing the African countries which are affected. First to Talal, as uh, promised, then we go to Hagida. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, the Middle East is preoccupied, uh, among other things, with the news from two courts nowadays. The first is the ICC court with the expected uh, 
decision by the judges on the arrest warrant for President uh, Bashir of Sudan. Um, now, I understand you uh, had this conversation with the President, but uh, in the light of the um, repeated uh, warning by officials that they cannot control the reaction of the streets, the people, the anger, and, and, and in case the decision of the um, judges comes negatively towards the president, uh, what assurances you were giving that your operation, your people, your staff will be shielded and protected from any anger in the streets of Sudan. And in the other court is the, uh, the special court of Lebanon. Uh, on the 14th of, of February, Saturday, is the fifth anniversary of the Hariri murder this year, is the fifth year. Uh, there is a, a feeling that the court is going nowhere in the Middle East. Can you give your undertakings that justice will be done, the perpetrators will be brought to justice sooner or later? Uh, first question. On this, uh, <clears throat> what kind of impact this ICC in indictment, if uh, it happens against the President Bashir? As I uh, repeatedly told you, the ICC is an independent judiciary organization. Uh, their function and responsibility is quite distinct and separate from the United Nations Secretariat. And therefore, I will have to await the decision of the ICC. <clears throat> Whatever the circumstances or decision of the ICC uh, may be, it will be very important for President Bashir and Sudanese government to react very responsibly uh, and ensure safety and security of the United Nations peacekeepers and faith protect the human rights of all the populations there and also faithfully implement the comprehensive peace agreement. And he should fully cooperate with whatever decisions the ICC makes. Uh, this is uh, very important fundamental uh, principles uh, he should take. On this um, <coughs> establishment of a special tribunal, I have again made it quite clear that <coughs> with the launching of this, this itself will give a very strong message. And there is a very legal, political symbolism uh, when we establish, when we decided to establish. It took quite some time uh, to be able to establish uh, this one. It was only possible that the, I have paid such a strong political determined will to carry on this one. Of course, you know, I, I should be very grateful to all the leaders in the region and the world who have uh, generously contributed to uh, <coughs> establish, to be able to establish this uh, uh, tribunal. And the necessary judiciary legal proceedings will continue. And I have... Uh, uh, already appointed uh, the judges and prosecutor has already been appointed uh, and administrator has already uh, in place. Uh, therefore, let's uh, wait and support and encourage the smooth uh, proceedings of this. Um, uh, Do you have faith that perpetrators will be brought to justice sooner or later? One day they will face their judgment. Of course, perpetrators must, must be uh, brought into justice. Yeah. That's the basic. But financing, financing. Financing, uh, as I said, uh, the financing, necessary financing for the establishment and the operation of for this court for one year has been secured. And I have to discuss with um, a member state again for necessary fundings. Uh, for the operational cost for second and third year. Yeah. Okay, Ragida. Yeah, as it turned out, I have a follow-up follow question, Mr. Secretary General, because uh, you had not wanted to meet with uh, President Bashir for legal issues in the past because your department, legal department, advised you against it. Yet you did. Now that you are awaiting, I mean, I mean, I, it, did you discuss with him potentially that you will be unable to continue to meet with him? should the uh, uh, court uh, endorse the indictment. And on, uh, the, on Gaza, in, uh, the investigation board, do you have assurances from the Israelis that they're going to work with you, they're going to allow this uh, uh, team in? Because they've had a history of rejecting uh, such a board to come in, Atisari and others. 
do you have assurances they will cooperate, especially that you've been under a lot of attack and some people are telling you to discipline your own UNRWA, um, they're asking you to discipline. I don't know if you feel uh, you know, bullied by that. And lastly, on the tribunal, um, do you expect indictments uh, soon? Do you, or because in the past you had said, well, take it easy, we're not going to go into indictment right away. Uh, do you now feel that you should leave that to the court? Do you have any idea that it would be going sooner, faster, or slower on the indictments? I respectfully ask you to choose one question, Sony, among three. <laughs> so I think uh, I should remind yes, the follow spokesperson. Up. Please have follow up. Because my colleagues have already <laughs> changed. So what was your choice you know, among three? You know. <laughs> Gaza, Gaza, Gaza. Two, Gaza. Of three. <laughs> Two of three. Two of three. Two of three. Uh, on this. Um, Oh, Sir, I mean, no, no. You're not bargaining over this. I follow up. Actually, the Gaza one. On this inquiry, uh, I have informed both Israelis and Palestinian, Israeli government and Palestinian authorities. I do not have any uh, doubt that uh, you know, they will not cooperate fully. I, I hope uh, they will fully cooperate uh, on the conduct of this inquiry uh, commission. And that's uh, you know, their responsibility. And since uh, Prime Minister Olmert uh, has promised me to uh, look into this issue himself and his government, uh, then uh, you know, I can expect a smooth uh, operation of this commission inside the Gaza and with other concerned parties. Okay. Uh, okay, this is an exception. <laughs> Uh, as you said, uh, now, I thought that uh, during this uh, Hadis uh, AU summit meeting that it would be uh, very crucially important uh, as Secretary General in discharging my duties as Secretary General, in ensuring peace and security, and ensuring safety and security of our UN mission and civil population that uh, I should meet uh, President Bashir at this time. Uh, we discussed at length uh, on this issue. You may remember that when there was a very serious crisis happened in Mujahiriya uh, area, uh, I had uh, very serious discussions with him. Then with these discussions, we were able to limit all these uh, casualties I, I was a little bit relieved uh, that uh, even with the bombings, aerial bombings uh, by Sudanese government, this first of all, Jem withdrew, and the Sudanese government, they bombed only outskirts of this uh, Mujahiriya, uh, avoiding all these you know, civilian uh, casualties and safety of uh, UNAMIT uh, uh, troops there. That's one thing. And uh, we discussed about the, all other implications of uh, ICC issues, but I'm not here to disclose on all this. Again, if he is indicted, this is the question. The straightforward question. Now, I will be advised. I'll have to be advised by my uh, legal and political advisors on that for my future course of actions. Okay, we are going to Masood now, but please, one question. We are running out of time. Mr. Secretary General, you were in uh, India and Pakistan recently. Mm -hmm. uh, at the uh, uh, recently, India and Pakistan almost came to a, a war again after the Mumbai attacks. Now, in your conversations with the leaders of India and leaders of Pakistan, did you at any point in time think or say, uh, uh, come to a conclusion that these two neighbors will be moving to any sort of a, a composite dialogue? Because that is a nuclear, um, uh, I mean, uh, nightmare at this point in time. So what is it that you can do? to bring the tension down, because at this point in time, both India and Pakistan are ready to go to war. As you said, uh, the right after this uh, Mumbai terrorist attack happened, the relationship between India and Pakistan was very tense. And uh, including myself, many world leaders uh, have very urgently and honestly appealed and urged Indian and Pakistan leaders to uh, first of all, calm down and resolve this issue uh, through a bilateral uh, uh, dialogue. At this time, 
But during my uh, visit to uh, both uh, Pakistan and India, uh, I, I was uh, reasonably uh, uh, relieved uh, and also was uh, gratified to uh, the leaders of both countries who have promised and who have committed uh, that they will, <coughs> first of all, fully cooperate. And Pakistani President and Prime Minister, they committed to me that they will uh, fully cooperate with India. From my part, I have urged the Pakistani leaders that they should uh, fully cooperate and full, thoroughly investigate this uh, Mumbai uh, terrorist attack. One important uh, thing which I took note of especially was that Prime Minister told me that Pakistani government was in the process of uh, enacting a legislation by which they can punish a perpetrators who would uh, who, who commit uh, crimes outside their territory. That was a very commendable one. Yes. <coughs> you have a follow-up? <coughs> Do you have a follow-up, Masood? Yes. I wanted to find out in that, did a uh, Kashmir issue come up? Because that is the core issue which is bringing down the relations between India and Pakistan. I was asked, uh, you know, by a reporter about that specific question. My answer was that uh, <coughs> the relationship of uh, both Pakistan and India is so important uh, in the subcontinent in the region. And therefore, all the pending issues uh, uh, should be resolved through uh, dialogue peacefully and through a composite dialogue uh, they have uh, initiated. Um, in your opening statement, you mentioned Sri Lanka and you, as well as Gaza. And you just also said uh, that everything should be resolved peacefully in Iran. And you also said it now with regard to Kashmir. I'm wondering with the, with the, with the uh, uh, offensive by the government in, 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 northern, uh, in northern Sri Lanka. Are you, are, and the hospital was bombed, various things are going on. Are you calling for a ceasefire in Sri Lanka, and, and as you have in Gaza and DRC and elsewhere? And if you're not calling for a ceasefire, can you explain why? On this issue, um, <clears throat> as you, know, you may know, I discussed with the special, uh, presidential special envoy who visited uh, New York. Uh, about uh, two and a half a week ago. And I discussed uh, this matter very seriously over telephone with the President Raja Paksa that he should uh, uh, avoid the civilian casualties and also uh, help those people caught in the fighting uh, so that they can be uh, transferred into a very safe uh, zone, uh, ensure the safety of United Nations humanitarian workers there, he assured me that he would do his best efforts. Now, this loss of uh, life is uh, too many there. And that should be thinking of all sensible people. The Sri Lankan issue is not, in fact, on the Security Council agenda. And respect for the sovereignty of member states is another principle I firmly uh, bear in mind. However, both the situation in Gaza and Sri Lanka are governed by international humanitarian law. I have consistently expressed my strong concern <coughs> regarding violations of international standards. First of all, uh, I have uh, expressed consistently on my concern at the ongoing violence and drawn attention, I have drawn attention to need for a political and not a military solution, and also specifically drawn attention to the pride of civilians. Uh, to some extent, the situation in Sri Lanka has been underreported, I think. Yeah. Uh, in my uh, conflict situation, the first thing you want to do is to understand the facts on the ground. Uh, then the, I'm, I have dispatched, in fact, my political director uh, to, to the region, to Sri Lanka. And I'm also considering dispatching some uh, humanitarian assessment team uh, as uh, whenever I think it's appropriate. Yeah. Okay, we'll, have, we'll go to Rwanda and then we'll go to the last question to uh, the BBC.
Laura. Yes, Rhonda. Uh, please, one question. Uh, in your participation um, in, at Davos in the forum on, on Gaza, I saw you writing. <laughs> And there was um, a there were presentations by the Prime Minister of Turkey and the Secretary General of the Arab League, both saying the importance of engaging with Hamas as a representative of the Palestinian people. I wondered if you had any response to their presentations made in that session, and in general to the to the need to have some the you know more of a a way of of building a unity among the Palestinian. Um, representatives by not choosing one one entity to support and another entity to not support now <clears throat> I have been uh, talking and contacting with the <coughs> representative of Palestinians uh, legitimate elected legitimate regime of Palestinian uh, authority uh, that's a basic uh, policy of the United Nations and quartet. Uh, but <coughs> at the operational level, uh, UN, the United Nations uh, has necessarily engaged with uh, uh, Hamas, but on issues of governance and the peace process, the United Nations along with the quartet uh, partners engages with the legitimate Palati Palestinian authority. Now this brings a very important issue the unity of uh, Palestinian uh, people. It is clear to me uh, that for any sustainable political pro uh, progress to occur and for Gaza to properly recover and rebuild, Palestinians must engage in reconciliation. Uh, that is why Palestinian unity is such a priority. Uh, after this uh, Gaza uh, situation, uh, crisis, I think this Palestinian issue has surfaced as the issue of uh, Palestinian uh, unity. I made the passionate uh, appeals uh, during my mission to, for Palestinians to overcome divisions and to work to restore one Palestinian government within the framework of the legitimate Palestinian uh, authority. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We have one more question left. We are already five minutes over time. In terms of reference of the Commission of Inquiry, uh, what are you going to do with the report uh, that you are going to get from your experts? And also, why limit it to the UN facilities only and not the, what happened in Gaza in general, considering that the United Nations presents its assistance to three quarters of the Palestinian people? He said. Shall we expect asking Israel to pay, for example, for the damage that happened to the UNRWA premises? Thank you. The report. Uh will first of all uh, be <coughs> examined uh, by the United Nations and myself and uh, for future course of action will be uh, determined, will have to be determined by, uh, by myself and the United Nations. Um, as for a broader, <coughs> a broader uh, issue uh, involving investigations, what had happened. In fact, uh, over the last uh, uh, three weeks, uh, unacceptable, very uh, serious <coughs> things that happened uh, involving all human tragedies and uh, casualties and construction, I mean, destructions of uh, uh, properties. And if uh, there is any uh, serious allegations of uh, violations of international humanitarian law, then there must be, I think, uh, uh, thorough investigations. But, but these issues uh, should be uh, dealt with by a proper a judiciary uh, organizations, uh, agencies at the first at the national level, uh, then I think uh, we will have to see what kind of a course of action should be uh, taken. <coughs> the last question, uh, Laura. Uh, um, if an arrest warrant is issued for Sudan's president, there will be pressure for the Security Council to pass a resolution suspending the work of the court for a year. Uh, do you think that there is a tension between peace and justice? And do you think there is a case for suspending the work of the court in the interests of peace in Darfur? Peace and justice are two very important fundamental principles 
of the international community, thus of the United Nations. Therefore, peace and justice uh, should go hand in hand. Now, <clears throat> on this uh, invoking Article 16 of Roman uh, statute, that is something uh, which has to be determined uh, by the uh, Security Council. Uh, I understand that uh, African Union and League of Arab States <clears throat> have been calling for this uh, uh, invocation of uh, Article 16. Uh, what is important at this time is that uh, before, uh, before coming to this stage, uh, which will have to be determined by the Security Council, the Sudanese government uh, should take necessary uh, domestic uh, judiciary measures which can or may, which may or can uh, satisfy the requirement of the Article 16 of the Rome uh, Statute. That is, I think, uh, first and foremost, important preconditions. Um, thank you very much. <coughs> thank you. No, no, no follow-up. No follow-up. We have, uh, we have over, we have gone over the time. Thank you so much. I know, I know. There are about five or six people who have not had a chance to ask either. Thank you so much.